Post the crazy question under the post. You go to one of your friends, you'd be like, what's going on with that post on Facebook? You know what I'm saying? You, or you, or you, you, you call somebody, you'd be like, why, why ain't you post that? What that mean, right? You don't post the nosy comment under the post. You ask somebody else, y'all looking at me like, y'all have no idea what y'all, y'all been doing it all week with this Will and Jada stuff. You still trying to understand what's, what's the smack on purpose? Was it a plan? I don't know what's going on. You, you are naturally curious. And guess what? Your curiosity about Jada and Will, and your curiosity about about Meg Thee Stallion, and your curiosity about what's happening in, in, in the community needs to translate to your curiosity about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? If you find out what's really happening between Will and Jada, what good is that going to do for you? But if you find out the truths, hallelujah, that are in this world, that are in this world, it will unlock for you more wisdom and knowledge than you've ever had. And sometimes we go through the same cycles because we have not learned the lesson. But the Bible is full of lessons. And there's different kinds of ways to learn, right? Uh, I think level one is learning from your own mistakes, but level two is learning from other people's mistakes. Uh huh. And this is full of wisdom and insight that will guide other people, that will guide you in your life. Okay, so let me go to my scripture here. Okay, here's our scripture that focuses on the work of prayer. It says, don't be anxious about what? Anything. But in what situation? Help me out. In what situation? Every city is, is kind of light. Sorry, I apologize. Y'all like, I can't see that. I should have made it bigger. My bad. It says every situation. In other words, before you go off, pray. Before you say what you really want to say to the telemarketer, pray. Say, hold on, I got to put you on hold real quick. I got to pray. He says, in every situation, with prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the God of peace will give you the kind of understanding that transcends and he will guard your heart and mind. Why, write this down. So for Nehemiah, he heard the haters or the enemies talking to him. And his first response to the haters was not to the haters. His first response was to God. Because guess what? If you really say what you wanna to say to the haters anyway, they don't care. Why don't they care? Because they're what? Haters, okay? All right, so Nehemiah understood this, and this is what I want you to understand. Nehemiah said this, prayer was his first response and not his last resort. Write it down. Prayer must be my first response instead of my last resort, okay? And let me go a little deeper with that. When times of opposition come, God wants you and I to rely on him. And the strongest way to rely on God or the purest form of reliance on God is prayer. It's prayer. And now mind you, you may be saying, hold on, Adam, wait a second. This brother says some stuff in here. He says in verse number four, he's praying to God. And he says, Lord, for, for, for they hate me. And he says, turn back their tongue on them. In other words, he's saying, Lord, get them, okay, Whatever vitriol they are pushing out on me, put it back on them, okay? And then he say, now he go, he go, now this is called, what some people call in the Bible, a curse prayer, okay? Not the language he's using, okay? Some of y'all are like, yeah, I do that all the time. No, that's different. That's, that's a different thing. Different thing. Different thing. Uh, he is praying a curse upon them. So he say, Lord, I want you to, whatever they push it on me, push it on them. Then he go spiritual. He say, Lord, do not forgive their sins. In other words, he's saying, Lord, send them straight to hell. This is what he's saying in his prayer. Okay? And this is not the first time this happens. This happens multiple times throughout the Bible. If you want to see some, some, some prayers that are like that, you can go to Psalm 58 and 6. You can go to Psalm uh, 69 and 25, which talks about break the teeth of my enemies and all this jazz. And you, you might be like, wow. The Bible is more violent than the walking dead, okay? It, wow, it, it's pretty graphic sometimes. But here's why it is okay for him to do this. And here's why this is a practice you and I should have. Because he is mad, but not only is he mad, he's hurt. Not only is he hurt, he's angry, and he is fussing, and he is venting, and he is ready to throw them bowls. But where is he placing this emotion? With God. Why? Because you'll never get arrested for threatening somebody to God. Some of y'all like, if you would have said that three years ago, 
You would have really been helping me. But he understands that I have to take this to somebody who cares. And God cares. Not only that, God is a safe space. Uh-huh. God's a safe space. He is a safe space. And I can turn this to him. So when we are praying, stop with this saying what you heard somebody else say in their prayer. Stop saying, you know what, I'm mad, I can't talk to God. When you're mad, you need to talk to God. When you don't understand, say, Lord, I don't understand why this is happening. When you're angry, say, Lord, why them and not me? Why now? Okay, when you feel like you're getting ready to go off on somebody or you're getting ready to get violent, you need to turn the violence in your hands and you be violent with your words toward God. And you may be saying, Alan Foster, I was not taught to pray that way. Well, let me help you. You can say how you feel to God for two reasons. Because God can handle it and because he already knows. One more time. Because he can handle it and he already knows. And guess what? Here's what I love about this. In verse number four, he's praying. And in the verse number five, he's praying. And he's saying, Lord, get them. Lord, get them. Lord, 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 let, 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 let their Beijing dry up so you can see the real color in their beard. Lord, get them. Lord, let the lace front like peel on the, on the top so they can see. It ain't there. You know what I'm saying, Lord? Let, snatch the edges. Okay? Okay? Let the BBL become a BBD. I don't even know what that is. I'm just throwing out random stuff. Okay? But here's what God does. Because he say to God, Lord, get my enemies. But God's answer is not getting the enemies. In verse number six, God, he prays that God would get them. But here's what God does. Here's the answer to the prayer. God does not, let me say it right. God does not punish the enemy. He prepares the people. Uh-huh. And how do we know that? In verse number six, it says he finishes praying and immediately what happens next? The wall is being built because the people had a mind to work. So the answer to God's prayer was not to get the enemy. It was to strengthen the people. And sometimes you're praying that God will get them back. And God said, I'm not going to get them back, but I'm going to strengthen you to be able to handle it. Uh -huh. I'm not going to get revenge on them. I'm just going to make you stronger and understand that you don't need them how you thought you needed them. You don't have to rely on them like you thought you had to rely on them. That I've got all power. Somebody say the, pop, the work of prayer. Okay, let me move. Okay. Next up, in verse number six, we've got the work of partnership. Okay, now this is important. Because this is a church, and we are, uh, uh, this is a, 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 a church, not the building, but the people. We're a church, and churches don't work without partnership. Amen. Let me say it again. Churches do not work without partnerships. And let me be clear. Some of us, uh, uh, even though the building is not the church, the coming of God's people together is the church. It does matter. Okay. Uh, Tony Evans has a saying where he says, he deals with people all the time, he's a pastor in Texas, and he says people say, well, you don't have to come to church to be a Christian, and that is very true. However, when you don't come, you miss out on something. It's like saying this, you don't have to go home to be married. Well, certainly, you don't have to live with your wife or your husband to be married, but when you don't live with them, you certainly miss out on a whole lot. Okay, I'm not going to get into all the details of what you might miss out on. You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all know you got a few kids up in here, so I don't want to get, you know what I'm saying, BT after dark on you every day. But <laughs> there's some things, hallelujah to God, that cannot happen unless you are together. Uh-huh, there are some moments of laughter and sharing and all kinds of things. And the same thing happens in the kingdom of God. There are some moments that you miss out on uh, uh, if you do not uh, become a partner, Okay. The Bible says this in 1 John, St. John chapter number 15, it says, remain, Jesus is talking. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit of itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Here's my part. Without me, you can do nothing. In other words, God says, I give you the strength to do everything you do. Amen. I give you the ability to do everything you do. And when we understand it that way, we worship God differently. Uh -huh. We collect offerings every Sunday. We're not collecting offerings so I can be rich. I ain't getting none of the money. Okay? We're not collecting. 
accepting the offering because we're trying to hustle you. We are trying to get you and I to uh, understand that when we're giving to God, we're not giving out of uh, 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 responsibility. We're giving out of love. We're saying, Lord, I worked 40 hours this week, and you gave me the strength to get through those 40 hours. So I just want to give you something that says thank you. To a pre There's this concept of tithing, which we've talked about before, and that is giving 10%. We don't mandate that anybody gives 10%. There are those who are giving 10%. But one of the reasons why they instated that is because they're saying, Lord, the truth of the matter is, if you gave me the strength to work all week, Really, 100% of this money is yours. Now, if you don't believe God gave you the strength, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But if you believe God gave you the strength, 100% of this money is yours. But you're asking me, if you would, for 10% to help put the ministry forward and to help reach more people, help save more people, help minister to more people, help more people get healed, help more people to get delivered, help more people to get uh, free. But it doesn't happen with just one person. It takes partnership. Everybody say partnership. We have to do this together. Uh huh. And I was going to put, me and uh, PG were talking last night and I changed it. I was going to put participation initially. I was going to put the work of participation. But participation really just means I show up. But it takes more than showing up. Uh huh. And here's the difference between participation and partnership participation says, I got to. Partnership says, I get to. Uh huh. When was the last time, okay, anybody married or you got a boyfriend or girlfriend in here, wave at me, wave at me, okay, all right, all right. Now, how would you feel, okay, I'm going to use Kayla in the back. How would you feel if your fiance, Kayla, was like, okay, I guess I got to take you out on a date. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know Kayla that well, but I think Kayla would be like, oh, you don't got to take me nowhere. I'll stay right here, okay, and you can go and do what you want to do. Because nobody wants to be seen as a duty. Uh huh. Everybody wants to be seen as something different, and participation sometimes has the concept of duty. Like you, you, they have a meeting, and you say, "Oh man, I just had to show up. I just had to show up. You don't want to be there. I just had to show up." They have the. Uh, I'm gonna pray for many of y'all for Thanksgiving because some of y'all is fasting and praying now because you're like, "I don't want to be around my cousins and all of them," but I just gotta show my face. Okay, some of y'all are real bougie, okay? You don't even come and eat the food. You just come in and you wave. You ask who made everything and you don't eat nothing. Oh, it was good for you when you was growing up and now you're like, I don't know who cooked that. Your sister, that's who cooked that. <laughs> the difference between uh, participation and partnership is your buy-in. Watch me. In this uh, book here, Nehemiah, the word people occurs 51 times in 62 verses. So this book is about partnership. Somebody say partnership. But not only are we partnering with one another, we are partnering with God. Uh-huh, write this down. Partnership communicates the value of taking an active role, not a passive role. One more time. Partnership communicates the value of taking an active role, not a passive role. Uh-huh. He says, he, he says, listen, I have given my people a mind to work. He's saying that's that's it. And, and what I love about it in verse number six, it says, so we built the wall. Nehemiah didn't say, I didn't do this by myself. We did it. Guess what? Last week we celebrated two years as a church. I didn't do this by myself. We did it. I don't make enough to keep paying for this building every Sunday that we, we did it. Okay, I, I don't have uh, the knowledge. I didn't, none of the people in this room did I know when I moved here. None of these folks, none of your wonderful, beautiful faces did I know when I came here. Matter of fact, this Sunday celebrates four years. This is the day we moved to Sun Prairie four years ago today, and we didn't know a soul in this room. So when you look around this room, it is an act of partnering, not only with one another, but partnering with God. Uh-huh. When, when we are here and moving and functioning together, it is an act of partnering with God. And God says, I want you to see my partnership with you and my church as something of delight and not of duty. Amen. I'm going to say that again. God wants your relationship and your partnership in the church and the ministry to be one of delight, not of duty. What does the Bible say in Psalm chapter number 34 and verse number 8? He says, delight yourself in the Lord. He's saying... I want you to find me delightful. Uh-huh. Don't you want to be delighted? That means joy. 
Okay, when, when, when you go out on a date or you step into a room and somebody like, ooh, man, you look sharp. You try to act like you ain't feeling it, but you feel it, you know what I'm saying? I try to do a little something, you know what I'm saying? You know? And you know, uh, uh, people, uh, especially people of color, have a very unique way of complimenting people, okay? We don't compliment people by saying you look nice. We just kind of name what you got on, you know what I'm saying? We just kind of name what, what you got Oh, okay, brown shirt. That's what they say to Alicia, okay? Okay, brown shirt. You know what that means? You look bad. Not bad, like bad, bad. Good, you know what I'm saying? They see Miss Beck, I see you, orange scarf. <laughs> when, when they say that to you, you're like, oh, I'm doing a little something today. You know what I'm saying? That, that means that, that mean they, mean they think you look good. Now, if they say, I'm trying to get like you, they're a hater. If they say that, now that's a hater line right there. When you say, how you doing? I'm trying to get like you. Okay, now you're just lying. We both broke, and you know that. So you're just talking crazy now, okay? So next up, we've got uh, a partnership. Say, I am a partner with God. Come on, say, I am a partner with God. And the last thing I want to say about this point is this. In this church, and different churches do things different ways. But last time, I said, and Gina said, don't say that anymore, but I'm going to say it this time. I said, we are not a sitting church. We are a serving church. And Gina didn't like that first S, so I changed it a little bit because it sounds too much like a curse word. So I changed it to this. Write this down. We are not a church of consumers. We are a church of contributors. Amen. One more time. We are not a church of consumers. We are a church of contributors, okay? And here's my last work for today. Next up, the work of persistence. The work of persistence. Oh, let me go back. Ruth, y'all remember when we did that series on Ruth? Let me tell you, this is about partnership and I go on to persistence. Partnership is so powerful that partnership has the ability to change your whole life. Ruth, okay, got connected with her mother-in-law. Anybody remember her name? What was her name? Naomi, right? She got connected with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and Naomi said, listen, you better get out of here. I've got nothing for you, okay? And Ruth said, no, I'm not going to leave you. I refuse to leave you. And I don't have time to go through the whole story, but she partnered with Naomi, and this is what partnership can do. Ruth went into the vineyard of Boaz and was working in his vineyard one day. And a few months later, God took Ruth from working in the vineyard. I'm talking about partnership. God took Ruth from working in the vineyard to owning the vineyard. Amen. I'm in the wrong church this morning. I said partnership took her from sun up to sun down, swing low, swing cherry, okay? <laughs> to yeah, you missed the spot right there. Pick that up right there because partnership will allow you to get where you're going faster. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay, now I can go to the next slide, okay? I didn't, I didn't want you to miss out on that because many of us, our biggest struggles are because we're trying to do everything by ourselves. You cannot do everything by yourself. You do not have the ability, okay, to do everything by you. You need help. And stop believing this Americanized idea that I can do it all by my. There is nobody who is self-made. Do you hear what? Nobody. I don't care who you follow on Instagram. I'm self-made. Did you have a mama Amen. when you weren't self-made? Did you have a daddy when you weren't self-made? There is nobody who is self-made. Because we all need some. Come here, uh, Joe Clark. We all need somebody. If y'all wouldn't have said that, I would have said, I'm in the wrong church. Let me walk out of here. Okay, so last point. The work of persistence. And this is very important. I don't have time to break it down like I want to, but here's our verse. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory. Watch me. He gives you the victory. You don't earn it. He gives you the victory. Like your job. You don't earn some of us, some of us are at jobs we, we don't even have the credentials for. He gave it to you, okay? He gives us the victory. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He don't say always in other people's business. He don't say always defending yourself. He says, I want you to always abound in the work of the Lord. 
In other words, I want you to find yourself whatever your hands find to do in God and his kingdom. For you know that your labor is not in vain. Your work may be in vain because you may go to another job. Your work may be in vain because you may get let go of that job. But God says anytime you make investments into my kingdom, it never goes to waste. Write this down. First Peter chapter number four, verse number 12 says this. He says, think it not strange concerning the trials that come to test you. Watch me. Stop being surprised when you plan on things going one way and they go another. Stop being surprised when you make up your mind to serve God and then people come up out the woodwork. Stop being surprised when you decide you want to give offering and you want to tithe and then something comes up with the car. Stop, stop being surprised. Stop being surprised that when you focus your attention on God, people try to pull you backward. It is not a strange thing. It is a common thing. Uh huh. Because opposition is to be expected. Let me say it. Let me say it this way, and I want you to write this down. Don't let opposition from the enemy disrupt your obedience to God. One more time. Don't let opposition from the enemy disrupt your obedience to God. Let me tell you something. Sam Ballot and Tobiah were haters. Okay? Straight up. They were haters. They were haters. Sam Ballot said, you know what? I don't have time to go into it all the way I want to. But he said that he called them feeble Jews. And he said, what are you going to restore? He said, are you going to sacrifice? He was mocking them. He was mocking them. Okay? And then Tobiah Okay, saying, what a second, wait a second, how are they gonna revive these this wall with stones and rubbish? And you know what? Nehemiah didn't say a word to them, he began to talk to God. What is the Bible telling us here? One of your greatest weapons for those who are hating, for those who are disrupting, for those who are trying to pull you out of the work of God, one of your most powerful tools is the block button. Glory God. Uh-huh. I've, I've got a weapon of spiritual warfare for you today. It's called do not disturb on your phone, okay? I've got a spiritual weapon that I want to tell you about today. You ready for it? It's called delete, okay? You have the, Nehemiah ignored those who came up against him. And let me tell you something else. Let me keep going here. It says, watch it. It says in verse number seven, that they had a mind to work. And then after they had a mind to work in verse number seven, it says, but Sanballat and Tobiah, okay, and the Arabians, it said they heard about what was going and they began to attack. Let me move here. You have to expect opposition. I'm gonna show you why I said that. You have to expect opposition. Okay, y'all look at the screen. Tell me who this is. Who's that? Okay, and what is Michael Jordan? Okay, a, a ball player. What else is he? A businessman, a legend, okay? A billionaire, okay? Some people would say the GOAT. I know some of y'all like LeBron's the GOAT. If you think LeBron's the GOAT, I, get out. Now. Wrong check. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But this man was so many things, okay? But one of the greatest things that he did is he was persistent, okay? Y'all remember that Michael Jordan, I don't remember how many, Lisa probably know because she's from Chicago, but listen, Michael Jordan won a bunch of championships, and then, do you all remember his father got murdered tragically? And then he took a break, but what did he do after his break? He came back into the NBA, and guess how many championships he won after that? Not one, not two, but three. In other words, do not allow situations to stop you from being persistent and doing what God called you to do, because persistence is a part of the process. Okay. Let, let me do this here and then I'm done. I'm wrapping up. You cannot see this good, okay? And I can't see it good, but I looked at it last night so I know what it is. This is Jerusalem, okay? Right here, this is Jerusalem, okay? Right here is Samaria, right here is Ashdod, and right here is Ammon. One more again. This is Jerusalem, this is Samaria, this is Ashdod, and this is Ammon, okay? Here's why that's important. Sanballat was from Samaria. Okay, that's 